welcome back and um, in this video we'll be uh, looking at ciphers okay um, there are two parts of ciphers so in this particular video we'll be looking at number one classical encryption techniques um, and then the next video we'll be looking at modern ciphers okay let's get started what is a classical ciphers well as the name suggests it's um, the ones that has been used a long time ago but Actually, when we later talk about modern ciphers, we didn't really get that far from it. So it's good to understand uh, how classical, cla uh, classical ciphers work um, in order for you to understand better about how the modern ciphers work. Um, all right, let's get started. So typically, uh, classical ciphers use um, one or the other, either substitution or transposition. Why? Because back in the day when you applied those encryptions, you had to manually solve them. That means you, you, you didn't have computers that can compute a lot of things fast and therefore people actually had to solve these by hand in order to retrieve um, the plain text. So that means you can't really use very hard um, cipher algorithms otherwise you, it would take forever for you to retrieve the plain text. Anyway, uh, substitution ciphers are further divided into monoalphabetic and polyalphabetic, but this will make sense um, as we go along, right? Let's get started with the very base, the very basic one, Caesar cipher. Okay, so uh, the Caesar cipher is one of the earliest known substitution cipher. Um, this is uh, invented by Julius Caesar, and the idea is very simple. You have um, the list of alphabets and what it does is based on a number you choose you shift the alphabet by that many times okay so it's well represented by this diagram here so uh, from original letter e this will be pushed back one two three times into letter b so in this instance the key size will be um we typically think it go to forward so like minus three for instance um, the thing with alphabet is once you end at z, um, letter z then you can recycle back back to a okay so every letter will be mapped to something else okay so let's have a look at an example okay uh, given the secret message p is hello world so p is just plain text um, k equals 10 so that means a letter a becomes letter K. So A, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. So A was one, K is 11. So we shift 10 spaces. Yeah. So, and if you're at Z, uh, it will map to uh, Z, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. Yeah. So letter Z will recycle back and map to letter J. Okay, so uh, what is the cipher text using Caesar cipher that we just saw? Okay, you can pause the video and calculate it now. Okay, assuming you have done that. Um, to encrypt, actually, this can be formed into a mathematical um, formula like this. Okay. Since we are cycling back after hitting the last letter, uh, this is a modulus operation. So it can be written such that uh, ciphertext C equals um, E of P. So here E is our encryption algorithm uh, where the variable is P. So we put P into, yeah, uh, uh, which equivalent to P plus K, K as a key, uh, mode 26. And uh, this is based on representing uh, letters to numbers. So A is 1, B is 2, and so forth. So with our example, hello world, um, you will end up with this. So hopefully you had uh, the same answer as I have here. Um, typically, when we use Caesar cipher, uh, we assume that we only use alphabet letters so things like the exclamation mark here just gets removed or it just um, uh, delivered as is okay however you, due to its nature you can always uh, add additional characters as necessary to use Caesar cipher okay 
So how do we go about decrypting this? You can think about it by pausing this video. Uh, yep. And so um, basically decryption for this one is quite simple. You just have to reverse the process of the encryption and that can be done by reversing the formula up there. So instead of plus K, now we have P minus K. Um, that should be C. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, P equals D of C which equals c minus k mod 26 okay so uh, remember to change that but it's not a big deal so that's um, how caesar cipher works so it's very simple right so let's have a look at uh, basically what it does so modular operation example is necessary to understand caesar cipher just like how i explained uh, letter z will map to um, letter j when k equals 10 okay so it's kind of like looking at a clock once uh, our clock needle passes the maximum number 12 it maps back to 1 after that okay so when working in modulus um, environment where uh, numbers are finite uh, and it's just going to be keep cycling within uh, the modulus number so if you didn't really understood this part please go and read the discrete math um, to catch up on this Okay, so here we are working in modulus tw uh, 12, uh, where once you hit over that number, actually mod 12, uh, 12 is 0, but 0 is represented as 12 here. Okay, so um, 7 plus 6 is 13, in mod 12, you look at the remaining value after dividing it by 12, so it's equivalent to 1. So having that concept, Caesar cipher basically is just a larger clock okay uh, but instead we are working with mod 26 okay and that's the number of uh, letters that we have if some other languages have a different set of um, alphabets um, then this modulus number can change to adapt to that so that's not a big issue okay so that's how exactly it works but um this mod operation is actually very helpful and um, we'll look at uh, how we can use mod operations in some other contexts. Uh, for example, looking at RSA um, later next week, which is five videos later-ish. Yeah. We'll look at that. Okay. So that's the Caesar cipher. We have, I have an ex exercise for you. So hopefully you'll pause the video and try to solve this by yourself. Uh, why? Because I ask things like this uh, in the test and exam. Uh -huh. um, so, cipher is known to you, Caesar cipher. Uh, key is unknown, we don't know what the key is. Um, the task is to retrieve a plain text. And here is the cipher text to you. Alright, have a go. Pause. Okay, so I'm assuming you have paused it and solved it but if you can't be bothered you can however skip it up to you um, did you find the plain text well that's what we call a brute force attack what it means is you tried um, all the combinations you thought it might be uh, and then um, re finally retrieve the plain text that resembles look like plain text okay so how long did it take you to brute force? Okay. Have a think before you uh, go over the slide. Mm -hmm. Yep. And basically, you only have a set number of tries that you just have to do. So, how many tries is that in Caesar Cipher? That is 25. Uh, you exclude the original value itself, so you don't map itself, you don't have to try that, okay? So, out of 26 letters, you only have 25 other characters you try, you have to try to shift it, okay? So, for Caesar Cipher using uh, English letters, the key size is 25. You only have to guess 25 times at most, and this is what we consider is very small, okay? So, we 
what we need to do is because often we assume that um, attackers or adversaries they know the algorithm so we need to protect or make sure that our key is very complex okay so what can we do to improve this correct you can use a different algorithm that requires a larger key size okay so and that's what we're trying to uh, move on to here so first example is using a monoalphabetic cipher that uses an arbitrary substitution so instead of using a value as a key now we're going to use words as a key and let's have a look how this works okay um there's a definition please read it so the way we construct monoalphabetic um cipher is like this uh let's say we have a secret key called market okay and what we do is uh, align market uh, under our original sequence of letters okay so market okay if you do have duplicate letters in your key you remove all the duplicates it has to be a unique set of letters okay so once you met uh, the key uh, under the original one uh, what you can do from here is following the last letter the remaining alphabet uh, goes there okay and then following the z if there were any letters that were skipped um, in the first two stages they all get appended at the end okay in alphabetic order okay so uh, we have to do the middle part um, the u v w x y z follows after t otherwise um, often these letters don't get used much, especially like X, Y, Z. So they still map back to X, Y, Z, which uh, in, com uh, in practice reduces the possible um, combinations that we can generate. Okay, So the rest alphabet letter follows the last let character and then the remaining uh, alphabet appends at the end of order. So that's what we can do. Okay, This way, uh, now the key size is much larger. How large is the key size now? You may have guessed uh, because the key has to be unique sequence of letters. Um, actually, you can start with a single letter all the way up to, um, for example, saying using all of that in random combinations. Okay, so you will end up with twenty-six factorial potential key sizes. Although not all of them may be uh, useful in the context. Okay. So now going from 25 or 26 possible keys, and now you're moving on to in areas of factorial. So this is much larger. So by hand, this is no longer really feasible to crack. Okay. So how do we go about um, cracking these? Right. Well, there are ways. This graph represents um, the frequency analysis of letters that are used uh, in uh, modern English language, for instance, and as you probably know, things like letter E gets used more, most frequently, uh, and then letter T, uh, letter A, and so forth, right? So that information can be used uh, to crack monoalphabetic ciphers. Why? Because individual letters are mapped statically to another letter. That means these kind of characteristics are still maintained uh, in, in the cipher text. Okay, let's have a look at an example. Uh, this is a cipher text retrieved from some message. Okay, uh, what we can do is apply frequency computation result. So if you uh, for this type of analysis, uh, if you can collect more cipher text, it gets more accurate. Okay, and once you uh, do the frequency analysis, this is the table that you get. Okay. And as you can see, there are oh, wrong way, a couple of letters that really stands out, uh, letter A and letter L. Okay. So by this, we can kind of try to map back the previous frequency graph onto this new frequency and see what makes sense. Okay. And eventually, by trying substituting and eliminating um, those words and especially when you find some words that make sense and even a couple of words are joined together uh, Then solving the puzzle from that point it becomes quite easy Okay, so this is what we call the frequency analysis attack
Okay, and monoalphabetic ciphers are susceptible to frequency analysis attack. Okay, so even though we moved away from small key size, there are various ways to actually crack uh, different ciphers. That's why designing these are quite difficult. Okay, so let's have a look at um, the next cipher that's been produced. Uh, this is VGNIR cipher, okay, VGNIR. Um, Monoalphabetic cipher fails to hide the frequency information. So this one is proposed in order to hide that information. So what we do is we use series of different Caesar ciphers. So you can see that ideas really didn't go that far. Um, what th this proposes is, all right, rather than using Caesar cipher once, we use it multiple times. Okay, so and this is called a polyalphabetic cipher. We are substituting uh, letters to a different letter depending on the positions. Okay, so here is a chart that you use uh, to um, construct cipher text and also retrieve plain text from Virginia Cipher, which uses a bunch of Caesar ciphers. So as you can see, in our first column, it's uh, it maps back to A to A and so forth. But in the second column, it has been shifted by one. And then the next column shift by two, and all the way down to shift by 26, uh, right? And if you go back, it's the original one, okay? So here's how it works. We have a plain text P, uh, we hack at noon, the, that's, that's our plain text. Uh, our key is paid. So here again, the keys, key size is the same. Uh, it can be 26 Victoria up to 26 Victoria, but here we chose paid. Um, and in this particular one, you can actually have uh, duplicate letters. It, it's okay to do that because, uh, but that letter will still map back to um, uh, the column that you're looking at. So what you do is uh, we align the plain text in the top row and key on the column. Okay and see uh, where they map onto, okay? So W and P combined together is going to map onto letter L, okay? So first letter in our ciphertext is going to be L, okay? Next, we look at letter E at the top and uh, letter A um, at the row, okay? Where did my mouse go? So next character is going to be uh, mapped back to its original position, uh, E. Okay. Next one, we have H. H will map onto I, I row. So here you follow I, and you have P. Okay. So we have um, L, E, P, and then you can construct the rest of the message. Okay. To do, encrypt the message. You can pause the video here. Okay, assuming that you have done it, um, our cipher text should look like this. Okay, and you can easily see from our last um, word, noon, that not all characters will map onto the same uh, letters. So here, the first N was mapped to C, first N is mapped to C. Uh, but the second N is mapped to Q, and same with the double O's inside noon. They're mapped onto different characters. And this is the advantage of uh, using polyalphabetic cipher. And these are actually quite useful even today. Okay. So how do we go about breaking this one? Well, there's always a way to break things. Um, and Although it's much harder than doing frequency analysis, a similar approach can be um, applied. So one of the technique is Kaczynski test uh, produced in 1863. Um, basically this test tells that there is a chance that a repeated word is encrypted using the same sequence of the key. So here's an example. We have Crypto is short for cryptography, blah, blah, blah. But here we have the key is ABCD, ABCD, blah, blah, blah. And the crypto has been mapped onto the same crypto. Of course, this is much difficult to uh, compared to the frequency analysis that we saw before. Um, but basically, this is just another step before you do the frequency analysis. Once you have collected sufficient uh, amount of 
uh, cipher text, these attacks are actually quite possible and people have shown that they can use these um, methods to break Virginia cipher. Um, however, of course, doing this by hand is very invisible and using uh, computers nowadays, it gets done much more easily. Okay, so now looking at transposition ciphers. Um, the aim is to hide the message by rearranging the letters without altering the original letters. So this is the cups going back and forth. Okay, um, Same as the monoalphabetic ciphers, these attacks are prone to frequency analysis attacks. And unless we change the letters, like what we did with Virginia cipher, it will always be susceptible to frequency analysis attack. Okay? Uh, one of the examples we'll be looking at is RailFan cipher or zigzag cipher. Uh, rel and cipher uh, works quite simple. Arrange the plain text in n dimension in a zigzag style. And that's pretty much it. That's the algorithm. Okay. Um, so here is a uh, two-dimensional. So n equals two. Okay. The plain text is uh, the answer is eleven. Um, and what the cipher text looks like is once you arrange it in a zigzag fashion. You just append row by row. So what you end up with, 10 vertebra has a D, yeah? Um, and if you didn't know the plain text, just by looking at the cipher text, that probably looked like very gibberish. So even after one iteration, uh, it already looks um, quite confusing, okay? Um, but the key um, item is that you can do it multiple rounds. Uh, however, do worry that um, there are limits to how many rounds it can do depending on the length of the text as well. Okay, but I will not get into that math behind. So the transposition cipher in that sense is very simple. It's just the different ways of just reorganizing. You can even use some mathematical formula for specific position, uh, for example, like a hash function. Uh, actually, hash function is not a good idea because you can go back anyway. Uh, formula to specify exactly what location, next location it should go to. You can use that. Okay. So in in summary, those classical ciphers um, in modern time they are not secure at all. Don't use them. Okay. Uh, unless uh, you exchanging some hand notes uh, as a secret and later you burn them all. Yeah. Um, due to limited key size and language characteristics. So those are the two main factors. Um, that restricts us using them. Okay? To improve the security of ciphers, uh, both substitution and transposition techniques are used together. So it's kind of like our two-in-one shampoos, yeah? but instead it's not a shampoo, but you use substitution and transposition together. And that's what modern ciphers are. Okay? So our next video, we're going to be moving on to modern ciphers. See you there.